planet Earth, home to a growing number of homo sapiens and a whole lot of other creatures. It's a great place to live. But when it comes to the future of our small planet, now to a dire warning about climate change. Natural disasters like hurricanes or wildfires. An unprecedented decline in nature threatening humanity. Six mass extinction event is already well. There's so much bad news about our planet, it's overwhelming. The fear that we're headed for a cliff puts most of us into a state of paralysis. truth is, I've given up, and the odds are, so have you. What are things that you're doing in your life to make an impact around climate change? Um, um, um uh, I mean, I like to, you know, do my part when I can, like with my metal straw. Going to the paper straws. No plastic straws. Paper straws versus plastic. Recycled straws. Every time I come here, I feel energized. If recycling and paper straws are our only hope, we are in really big trouble. But what if there was another path? This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet and keep our species off the extinction list. In fact, the solution I'm talking about is right under our feet. And it's as old as dirt. We call it soil, earth, or ground. And due to its vast scale and its ability to sequester immense quantities of greenhouse gases, it could just be the one thing that can balance our climate, replenish our fresh water supplies, and feed the world. That's why some people are racing to save our soil in hopes our soil just might save us. I am a conservation agronomist. We get the soil right. We can fix a lot of our issues. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant. Healthy plant, healthy animal, healthy human, healthy water, healthy climate. This is what this is about today. Learning how the soil works and learning how to farm like nature does. The message is simple. But getting that message out is difficult. We have a social problem. We have an education issue. And until we get that right, we can't fix our ecological issues. I have been in NRCS for 31 years. It was kind of amazing to me as I was teaching all over the country. I'm going, wow, our producers don't really know how the soil works. They don't understand the basic ecological principles. Everything runs by carbon. We're built by carbon. The soil microbes run by carbon. Carbon is the driving engine. It runs the system. But when it comes to the role of carbon in our world, there's a bit of confusion. What is carbon dioxide? It um, comes from... Um... That's a trick question for me. You're, you caught me off guard on that. I, know, I guess that would be carbon and two atoms, two molecules of, dioc of whatever. <laughs> Something bad? It's poison that you're breathing, and it will destroy you. To be specific, carbon dioxide is a gas. We breathe it out, and plants breathe it in. We also make carbon dioxide by burning fossil fuels. But carbon isn't bad. In fact, it's the basis for all life on Earth. There's a tendency right now for us to be at war with carbon. Carbon's the bad guy, and I think this is a lost opportunity. Carbon's the good guy. We're carbon. I'm 16% I'm carbon, and all of it came from eating vegetation and things that eat vegetation. Plants use sunlight as energy, and they pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They turn it into a carbon fuel, and that's how they grow. 
But 40% of that carbon fuel, they send down to their roots. They're leaking it out in a very strategic way to soil microorganisms. Plants are feeding soil microorganisms carbon, and the soil microorganisms are bringing plants mineral nutrients. And in the process of all that, those soil microorganisms make a carbon glue out of that carbon fuel. And they make habitat in the soil. They make little pockets in the soil to control the flow of air and water. And that's one of the ways that carbon gets fixed in the soil. In other words, soil has the unique ability to sequester carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That's a big deal. And what's even more amazing, the soil contains an entire universe of life. Here I went to years of college and I took soil science. I didn't know. I really did not know how the soil worked. It's alive. In every handful of healthy soil, there are more organisms than the number of people who've ever lived on planet Earth. I believe in miracles. Where are you from? You sex a thing, sex a thing, you. And those organisms are processing organic matter that's in the soil and putting the nutrients into a form that the plant needs. Comparing the soil microbial diversity to the microbial diversity that we're now seeing inside the human organism, you have more bacterial cells in your body than you have human cells. Yeah, we're about 1% human and 99% microbes. <laughs> It's the truth. The food that we eat, we actually chew and break that food material down into little bits that get eaten by the bacteria in our gut. When you eat kale, <laughs> let's say, when you're eating kale, your body doesn't consume kale. The bacteria consume the kale. And you feed off of what the bacteria have processed and released by the consumption of that kale. The key to health is eating dirt. <laughs> and what I mean by that is we need to eat what's in the dirt that's transferred to the plants that then we eat and create health. Taking care of the microbes in the soil is critical for human health. But spraying the soil with toxic chemicals, well, does something else. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Spraying the soil with toxic chemicals kills the very microbes we need to give us health and pull the carbon from the atmosphere. The more tilling that's done, the weaker the soil gets and the more farmers feel compelled to use chemical sprays. This is the vicious cycle of industrial agriculture. It takes more nitrogen now to raise a bushel of grain than it did in 1960. Our chemical fertilizers mask the problem of degraded soils. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Today, our most common crops are genetically altered to resist the spraying of toxic pesticides. For example, the number one crop in the United States, field corn, is almost entirely sprayed with glyphosate, a chemical suspected to cause cancer that's so oversprayed, it's found its way into our drinking water. chemicals, which were considered dangerous to begin with, are now being used at rates that would have been inconceivable 20 years ago. Every year, for every American alive, three pounds of toxic chemicals are sprayed onto the food grown on our farms. That goes into the soil, it goes into the water, it goes into our bodies. It's not just on the food you eat. It's everywhere. 
Most of the agricultural industry's pesticides and herbicides transfer directly through breast milk to babies. There are over 200 peer-reviewed studies that correlate the spraying of these toxic chemicals to effects like ADD in children, pediatric cancers, and birth defects. That's why juries have begun to award billions of dollars in damages to people who contracted cancer after using glyphosate. We know, for example, that glyphosate, which is also known as Roundup, has an effect on the gut microbiome that may lead to disturbances that can create disease, including cancer. A big reason these chemicals make us sick is because just as toxic chemicals kill the microbes in the soil, they also kill the microbes in our bodies. What I tell people is, your body can handle acute stresses, but it cannot handle chronic stresses. Soil ecosystems the same way. If you keep dumping the fungicides, you keep dumping the herbicides, you keep dumping the insecticides, you keep doing the tillage, chronic stress, it doesn't function anymore. Since chemical agriculture ramped up worldwide in the 1970s, we have lost one third of the Earth's topsoil. But industrial agriculture isn't just harming our soils, it's also affecting something much larger. The most massive tsunami, perfect storm is bearing down upon us. But fossil fuels, carbon, coal and gas, are by no means the only thing that is causing uh, climate change. Now, because the fate of water and carbon are tied to soil organic matter, when we damage soils, you give off carbon. Carbon goes back to the atmosphere. Healthy soils absorb water and carbon dioxide. But when we destroy soil, it releases water and carbon dioxide. This dries out the soil and turns it into dust. The process is called desertification. And how we deal with it could determine the fate of more than just our climate. Desertification is a fancy word for land that is turning to desert. And this happens only when we create too much bare ground. Soil and the plant and the climate are connected. If you don't have a living plant, you're gonna have more evaporation. What we want is transpiration when the moisture leaves through the plant. When it does that, it increases humidity, and when it increases the humidity, we have more rain. 60% of our rainfall comes from the ocean. But a lot of people don't realize 40% comes from small water cycles where our rain comes from inland. What's going on is we disrupted the small water cycles. That's when you have too much sensible heat coming off bare soil. You're having these huge vortexes of hot air going out. Instead of attracting the rain, it's pushing the rain clouds away. Take one square meter of soil and make it bare. And I promise you, you will find it much colder at dawn and much hotter at midday than that same piece of ground if it's just covered with plant litter. You have changed the microclimate. Now, by the time you are doing that, 
on more than half the world's land. You are changing macroclimate. According to the United Nations, the world's remaining topsoil will be gone within 60 years. In other words, unless we find a way to save our soils, we have 60 harvests left. The global scale of the problems we face may seem insurmountable. But in every fight that seems unwinnable, there are those who refuse to give up. We're very fortunate to have Ray Archuleta with us today. Ray, as you can tell, is, uh, is someone that has quite a bit of notoriety. He's got his own, he's got his own reality show. Now, that <laughs> I'm going to turn the floor over to Ray. And Ray, we appreciate you being here. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Ray. This is a supercomputer model by NASA. We're concerned of the red and purples being CO2. I want you to notice the dates. That is February, March. Now, what are we doing? March, April, what do we do in modern agriculture in April? We are tilling. We're tilling the land. And look at the huge plumes of CO2. Look at the dates. May. Now. Let's see what happens around June. Look at the colors change. Ladies and gentlemen, what is happening in June? <laughs> Do you see how powerful the living plants are? Can you imagine if we had all our rangeland and all our cropland covered? A covered planet is a healthy planet. He's an environmentalist and the editor of Draw Down, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. Please welcome Paul Hawkins. Tell us why your plan is different and why it is the most comprehensive. Well, it's very different because it's the first one ever. <laughs> wow. You cannot achieve drawdown without biosequestration. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, perennials, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the sink of the soil and retain it for decades, if not centuries. What we did is map, measured, and modeled the 100 most substantive solutions to global warming. And what I mean by solutions, I mean things that are at hand. We know how to do it. They're scaling. And if we continue to scale in a rigorous but reasonable way over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. When you talk to people about this great technology that has existed for millions of years that takes carbon out of the atmosphere and stores it safely in the soil, and that it's called plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. If we are going to succeed in balancing our climate, we do need to switch to renewable energies. But none of that will alter the tremendous amount of carbon we've already put into the atmosphere. Since 1750, when the Industrial Revolution began, we've pumped about 1,000 billion tons, also known as gigatons, of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. It's called our legacy load of carbon. 
And even if we stopped all greenhouse gas emissions today, that legacy load of carbon will still be there. That legacy load of carbon dioxide is still going to be warming the atmosphere for decades, if not centuries. So if all we talk about is reducing emissions, it's not enough. If electric cars and solar panels aren't enough, then what is the solution? The only goal that makes sense for humanity is drawdown, a year-to-year -year reduction in carbon in the upper atmosphere. Anything else is climate chaos. If we want to achieve drawdown, we have to go thank the Earth and start to farm and grow our plants and trees in an entirely different way. Once you achieve drawdown, within 20 years, you have cooling. You have the beginning of cooling. So now we have a horizon that if you're 20, 30 years old, you can say, in my lifetime, we can achieve this. In other words, the very practices that heal our soils will also heal our climate. To stabilize Earth's climate, we can use the most powerful carbon capture technologies, the photosynthesis of plants and the microorganisms in the soil. And the one type of farming that does this the best and draws down the most carbon is based on the concept of regeneration, which simply means to repair the damage we've done and make things better. So we are sitting in a food forest. This is agroforestry. It's agriculture through trees, tree diversification. I've got an avocado tree, banana tree, fig tree, coffee trees. We went from a lot of crop of single Haas avocado to now having about 40 different fruit varieties on site. Because my home is where my food is grown. I'm going back to the earth. By diversifying, we can now have harvests every month. If you're looking to do something that would greatly impact Mother Earth, plant a tree. You don't need acres and acres and acres to build a food forest. You really just need a few hundred square feet. You're gonna look outside one day and go, what is something we buy every day at the grocery store that instead of waiting for it to be shipped around the world to me, what can I put in my own backyard that I can do myself? And truly be forgiven, we must all get back to living with the land in harmony. I'm going back to the earth. I'm going back. Regenerative agriculture grows more food per acre. It's scalable to our entire agricultural system, and what's more, it's already being done right now, today. So I'm taking it to a field here that is a multi-species cover crop. The purpose of a cover crop is to enhance the life and the function of the soil. Think of it this way. If I'd grow a monoculture on this field, would only be feeding the soil biology one type of root exudate. I'm growing 19 species here. We're accelerating biological time. We're feeding the soil biology what it would take a conventional farmer 19 years to do. I'm doing it in one year. So people might ask, how do you get any money from this thing? Our livestock will graze this during the winter, speeding up the process of regenerating those soils. Animals grazing living plants are a part of the carbon cycle. Here in the Northern Plains, our soils were formed by large herds of bison and elk being moved by predators. 
grazing a landscape, trampling that carbon, the plants onto the soil surface, not coming back for maybe a year, or allowing full recovery. It wasn't that long ago that over 60 million buffalo roamed the continent. And the people who lived here for millennia knew exactly how to coexist with those animals. My name is Charging Eagle of the Oglala Lakota of the Seven Council Fires. There was this story of creator Tukashila telling our people to follow the buffalo, and the buffalo will show you where your lands are. This whole area, this whole region belonged to our people, the Lakota, Dakota, Nakota Nation. My ancestors, they lived in a period of time when everything came from nature. You can actually drink from the rivers, eat what was caught in the rivers, gather berries. Everything was a part of this bigger circle. And the buffalo meant the world. The buffalo meant everything to us. We became the buffalo. We were known as the Buffalo Nation. We didn't see ourselves as above animals or below animals. We were just right there with them. And they took care of us. We became a part of that bigger system. In an attempt to starve the Native Americans, the U.S. military and the railroads killed most of the buffalo. By the time the calling ended, only a few thousand of the majestic animals remained. When you become a part of what I call the accumulation culture, when you live in that culture, you're gonna lose track of what it means to be a part of something else. Because when you start to accumulate, you tend to forget what is important and you become separate. The more you become separate, the unhappier you're gonna become because you're gonna want more and more and more. Accumulation is like an addiction. It's part of this illness, this addiction that prevents us from being sustainable with nature. I mean, being, being thankful for this earth, for this piece of ground that we have. We have to look at all of these things, the global warming, the loss of drinking water, all of these negative things happening, the violence, the war, all of that is all rooted in that accumulation cultural mindset. We have to be able to let some of that go now. We have to say, okay, we've done enough, enough's enough. That's where we're at right now, and, and it can be done. Recent studies show that when cows are kept on pasture and constantly moved, like the buffalo, they not only help sequester carbon, they help rebuild entire ecosystems. That's regeneration. A new breed of farmers and ranchers are using hooved animals to restore damaged land. I was raised in a rural area in Washington, adopted by a Lakota elder. We were out in nature every day. I found permaculture, and that was very influential in my life where I could see that there could be a permanent agriculture, an agriculture that not only fed the planet, but also fed the people in a way that regenerated and didn't deplete resources. Holistic ranchers like the market guards use careful planning so their cows sequester carbon and actually regenerate the land. Cows can be good. That is one of the most controversial statements of mankind at this point. Using cattle, allowing them to roam and graze and plan grazing can literally revive enough space to create a tremendous amount of drawdown. I'm from Southeast Louisiana. I grew up in an incredibly delicate ecosystem. Conservation was always a very serious part of my life. I had no idea 
that the earth was desertified. I got on a plane from New York City to fly to Zimbabwe to meet Alan Savory. So he could show us the difference between desertification and regeneration. Land that has been holistically managed through planned grazing using cattle, the most vilified animal in the world. We are in Africa right now driving through a field that has been under Alan Savory's holistic management for nine years. And it is in Eden. This is what you call high grass. Using livestock to reverse desertification is totally scalable to about two thirds of the world's land. And nothing else is. And frankly, that can be done at extremely low cost. Here we are. This is what it should be like. You've been working on this land for eight or nine years. It went from a place of turning into a total desert mm. and using hooved herding herbivores. Mm. You've literally transformed that, what we've been seeing, mm. into this. Yeah. How in the hell do you make this happen? The dung, the urine, and the hooves of the animals are what cause this grass to grow. That livestock is never on more than a hectare of this land, about two and a half acres, never more than three days. Right. And they're never back on that piece of land under about six to nine months. Wow. So no plant can get overgrazed. You can come any day of the year anywhere on this land and you will see no livestock because they will be on less than one hectare of land. And unless we take you there, you won't even know it. Dealing with this beast of climate change, a lot of people don't understand that this helps climate change. Yeah. This sequesters carbon. Yeah. This takes the one thing that we so desperately need out of the air. Yeah and it holds it, and it makes oxygen. Yeah, if we can produce solid grassland, you can pull down enormous amounts of carbon back into the soil. Two thirds of the world, roughly, is grasslands and savannas where the rainfall is too low to support a solid canopy of trees giving you soil cover. So grass is essentially what has to stabilize that soil. You look at this and you realize this is what the world should look like. This is what Africa should look like. This is what South and Central America should look like. This is what Texas should look like. This is how we win. We can get the earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. When used smartly, herbivores can pull down carbon and reverse desertification. But it doesn't just work for Africa. It works everywhere in the world. The form of agriculture that we use creates billions of lives in the form of soil microbes, in nematodes, in grassland birds. All of that wildlife is flourishing under an agriculture system versus a tilled crop field, which is denuded of life. The odds are there are some things that you can do to save our soils today. Compost is the natural decomposition of organic matter in nature. In a forest floor, it's when the leaves drop, the fungi and bacteria take it over and literally build the soil at the root zone. Compost is all about community. From the community of microbes that are breaking down the pile to the community of individuals in Los Angeles that are physically turning and sifting and contributing to that pile. 
Everyone is connected to the soil. Everybody is connected to the soil, no matter who you are, what color, male, female, it doesn't matter where you come from. We're all connected to the soil. And for me, I'm concerned about that one inch, right? That takes years to develop one inch of soil. I collect food scraps from restaurants, manure from zoos, manure. Do you know why? To keep this stuff out of landfills and use it to make good, rich dirt. That's why. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it? Because it's really not waste. continents and other really large regions that are getting hit with a double whammy of higher temperatures and drought. This kills soil. It kills life. One of the solutions to that challenge is to collect the food scraps from cities like San Francisco, turn them into compost, and get it onto local farms, and that helps them retain water because compost is a natural sponge. The unfortunate reality is most trash or garbage gets incinerated or sent to a landfill. We collect our food scraps, we put them in the green bin, it goes off to Recology's compost facility, we turn it into compost and it gets on a farm. That's a simple solution. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. The more we choose regenerative foods, the more the farmers will grow them. We're at a critical moment in human history. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The way we're articulating it is the regenerative diet. If we do eat meat, we need to eat meat that comes from pasture raised grass-fed, humanely killed animals. This is the most crucial choice all of us can make for the future of the planet. What are we eating? What kind of farming systems are we supporting? Are we regenerating the earth or are we degenerating? If you look over here, we have my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallowed. It has had nothing growing on it for over a year except for the few Roundup-resistant weeds that are on here. It's an ecological desert. Then you look over at our paddocks. You have a diversity of different plant species. You have insects, you have wildlife, plus the livestock grazing on it. We're capturing sunlight from early in the spring till late in the fall, converting that sunlight into liquid carbon to drive and fuel the system. There you have soil. Over on this side, you have dirt. Where do you want your food to come from? Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. All over our planet, people are using the practices of regeneration to heal the land and balance the climate. Some of these projects are big. We know that about 25% of the world's land mass has been degraded by human beings over historical time. When we look at the cradles of civilization, Greece and Rome, we find that many of these places have turned into deserts. The sand is blowing across the ruins of once great civilizations. A list plateau the cradle of Chinese civilization was the place where settled agriculture first began. When I was asked to film the baseline study in the Lis Plateau, I found myself alone standing on a mountaintop and I could look in 360 degrees and there was no vegetation. This was fundamentally ecologically destroyed. It was called the most eroded place 
filled with miserably poor people. So I felt that I had to spend the rest of my life dealing with this. It was hard to imagine at that time that you could restore that. So from about 1994 till 2009, 14 years, an area of 35,000 square kilometers, approximately the size of Belgium. They had the top Chinese scientists, they had international scientists from the World Bank supporting them. They created mapping systems with satellites so that every watershed had a unique address. The results were stunning. Hundreds of millions of people were lifted out of poverty. We met people who were illiterate, and their children now go to the top universities in the country. Human beings emerged in paradise. If we restore all the degraded land on the earth, we can return to paradise. If we start now to build a restoration economy, a regeneration economy, this is the way forward to see a stream return and flow, to bring back fertile soils, to see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated. This is where everyone can find tremendous satisfaction. When I look into your eyes, it's like watching the night sky. Or a beautiful sunrise Well, there's so much they hold So let's restore a little bit of paradise every day. It's not that difficult. If we stop distracting ourselves with shiny objects and we start to think about what's really important to us, to see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated. This is where everyone can find tremendous satisfaction and the meaning of our lives. We're all in this together. <laughs> every action that we take affects every other action, like a ripple in the pond. So what decision are you going to make that will make a positive impact on this beautiful planet so that our great-grandchildren, seven generations in the future, can actually go up and hug an old-growth redwood tree and swim in clean waters and be able to open their mouths and drink while they're swimming? And what is it? that we can do today so that our children can flourish in the abundance that we've created by our decisions. When you are at your best in the world, a lot of the times you're, you're feeling your best in nature. You're at your best in nature and, and there's something there. There's something ancient there. The wisdom of that, it's sacred. It's one path to being happy in the world. It's not about religion. It's not about politics. It's about love. And if you love something or you love somebody, you want to understand them and you want to like take care of them and protect them and keep them safe. And that's what we're all here to do. Even like the little mycorrhizal fungi and the worms and the bacteria. And if we take care of them, they'll take care of us. From the smallest microbes to the largest creatures, our blue planet pulses with life. For millions of years, it has self-healed and self-balanced. But today, our species faces its biggest test. Our mission is simple, 
we must harness the regenerative power of Earth itself. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up. And neither should you. Even the stars, they burn. Some even fall to the earth. We got a lot to learn. God knows we're worth it. No, I won't give up. I don't want to be someone who walks away so easily. I'm here to stay and make the difference that I can make. Give up on us, even if the skies get rough. I'm giving you all my love. I'm still looking up.